Um, welcome. Got it. Um, welcome to the National Community Solar Partnership community-based organization convening on tools for equitable community solar. Uh, I think it's fantastic to see so many friendly faces online and also so many new faces. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction and I apologize if there's a cat behind me. Uh, she will be joining us for the, the conversation today. Um, but I'm Nicole Steele. I uh, joined the Department of uh, Energy at the end of January and have been advising the Solar Energy Technologies Office on workforce and equity issues. And I also lead the National Community Solar Partnership. So if we can go to the next slide. I wanna make sure that everyone knows that today we will be recording this meeting. Uh, so this Zoom meeting is being recorded and may be posted on DOE's website or used internally. If you do not wish to have your voice recorded, please do not speak during the call. If you do not wish to have your image recorded, please turn off your camera or participate by phone. If you speak during the call or use a video connection, you are presumed consent to recording and use of your voice and image. So I wanna make sure everybody fully understands this slide. We are being recorded um, and you should have received a message and needed to hit the got it button um, that we are being recorded. So on to the next slide. Really quickly, uh, while this is a two hour meeting, we have a really, really tight agenda. Uh, so just going through super fast so that you have a good sense of what the day is gonna include. Um, for those of you who are new to the National Community Solar Partnership, we're gonna give a quick overview of both um, the Solar Energy Technologies Office and, and the National Community Solar Partnership and what it is up to. Um, we're excited to have uh, Shalonda Baker join us to talk about the connection to the Justice 40 initiative, as well as dive into um, our new website and our online community platform and how to get signed up and how to use it. Um, we will have a breakout session about halfway in. Um, so I'm actually super excited about this portion. So please do stick around for that. Um, this is an incredibly important part of the agenda um, where we do get to talk to folks directly. So we will go into uh, different breakout rooms and uh, that portion of the meeting will not be recorded. Um, however, we will be taking handwritten notes. Um, and then the last part of the conversation today is really getting into the weeds around our technical assistance program and um, the fact that it is now rolling, which is incredibly exciting instead of just being in specific rounds. So we'll talk about how you qualify the types of things that we can do and how to actually go through that process and really hear directly from both our technical assistance experts and folks who have gone through the technical assistance program already. Uh, next slide, please. So some ground rules for today. Like I said already, this is a public recorded meeting. Uh, recording and slides will be shared with attendees and posted to the National Community Solar um, Partnership website. Uh, I do want to encourage folks to use the chat function. Um, I think by now we all know how to use chat, um, but definitely feel free to uh, ask questions, um, we will do a moment where everyone introduces themselves, um, but please do be respectful. And we do ask for active participation. Um, so utilize that chat to ask questions, turn on your camera. We love to see smiling faces, obviously understand if um, that is not a capability of yours. Um, do feel free to raise your hand during, during the Q&A se session so that we can um, get to you. And if you have any uh, IT issues, tech issues, uh, Jackie Petrie, who is on the line um, from the National Renewable Energy Lab, uh, just chat her directly, Jackie Petrie, P-E-T-R-E, -E, um, and she can get you all sorted out. Next slide. So you, you may be wondering why you're here. Hopefully you have a sense of why you're here based on emails that we sent earlier, um, but uh, really at a high level, uh, folks know that the, this new administration, the Biden administration, has a goal uh, for deployment of rapid clean energy um, by 2035. And so the National Community Solar Partnership is a big part of that effort, recognizing that only 50% of households um, 
uh, are really solar ready and um, it could be even more than that for folks who don't like the aesthetic and other reasons. Um, there's also the Justice 40 initiative and uh, that is an initiative that is um, a whole of government approach to ensuring that the benefits of clean energy flow uh, to disadvantaged communities. Um, and Shalanda will be here to talk a bit more about how the National Community Solar Partnership and Justice 40 are working together. Um, we also really um, are holding a number of these convenings to make sure that we're creating a platform. Obviously, we're all in this uh, digital environment and it makes it a little bit more difficult to meet new folks and have conversations. Uh, but we really wanna be intentional about making connections with organizations at the federal level, the regional level, state level, and local levels, um, and want to make sure that folks have an opportunity to connect one on one and get contact information and really um, learn from one another um, and share ideas and other opportunities. Uh, we will also, we wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to really dive into the tools that are available today. So I mentioned the new website and the, the technical assistance program. So we will be diving into that. And like I said, um, expanding the National Community Solar Partnership Network and its impact. On to the next slide. So with that, I am going to turn it over to our acting director of the Solar Energy Technologies Office. That is Garrett Nielsen. He has been with CETO for 10 years and really has been working across all technologies, including soft costs. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to have Garrett join us and give a good welcome um, from the, the office wide level. So with that, uh, do, is Garrett on the line? I am here, can you hear me? Absolutely. Thanks so Excellent. much. Excellent. Well, thank you, Nicole, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. You know, when people think about the Solar Energy Technologies Office in the Department of Energy, really think about technology investment, think about hardware, things you can hold, think about the electric grid, and so forth. That is only one part of our job. You know, we really want to make sure that we are making solar accessible to all Americans, and a huge part of that work is figuring out how we can enable and expand new business models like community solar particularly with an eye towards equity and increasing access for all Americans in this space. We won't be able to decarbonize the energy system with just technology alone. It's business models like these that will be extremely important. Our office invests in everything from material science that goes into a module, to how you operate electric grid, to everything in between, all the way up to, uh, sorry, concentrating solar thermal power. And I just want to say that, you know, it's it's efforts like these that are really where the steel hits the ground, where the rubber hits the road and all the rest of those. And we're really excited to be supporting all of you in furthering community solar here in the U.S., including in increasing climate resiliency, increasing community resiliency, increasing jobs and driving local community benefit. So with that, I just want to thank you all again for taking the time to join us today. I know it's a packed schedule, so I'll be short and I'll hand it back over to Nicole. Thanks again. Everybody. Thanks so much, Garrett. Really appreciate you giving us that context. And I see that folks are already starting to uh, drop their name and organization into the chat. And so uh, because we are a large group, we will do introductions that way. Um, but we will also have an opportunity to do introductions when we do our breakout sessions. So if everyone could right now uh, drop their name, organization and location where they are, and your role in that organization in the chat. I'd love to sort of see the variety of folks that we have in the room today. And while you're doing that, um, I wanna make sure that we have time to introduce uh, some of the National Community Solar Partnership team and facilitators. So from the DOE team, we have Pam Mendelson, Anna Balzer, Julia Ostepej, um, Shaney Vines, Timothy Siegler, and Marissa Morales Rodriguez. And then from the NREL team, we have Robin Burton, Jenny Heater, and Jackie Petrie. And then from the Lawrence Berkeley team, we have Greg Laventis. And so those folks will be your facilitators today um, when we break out into our discussion groups. Um, we also wanna make this, uh, this these two hours as interactive as possible. So we will be including polls throughout the event as well. And so we are going to launch the first poll. 
And in one word, uh, we want to see, and so this will be a Mentimeter type poll. I guess that's the, the, not the right technical name. It's called um, Poll Everywhere. <laughs> Uh, but there, Jackie will be dropping a link in the chat. And so cut and paste that link from the chat um, into your browser. And in one word, what is the biggest barrier to deploying equitable community solar in your community? And so if folks can both introduce themselves in the chat, and I see so many names and organizations coming in and join the, um, the poll everywhere poll, what is the biggest barrier to developing equity community solar in your community from your perspective today before having this conversation? Um, we'll take a moment to sort of take a look at what pops up on our screen. I see a giant black lack of I'm sure all kinds of things capacity funding expertise regulations partners lots of policy and utility love that there's community in there that's such an important element to what we are doing cost i think i could have made that guess. <laughs> Lots of other really interesting words in here, economics, inequality, regulatory, enabling legislation, um, limitations in laws, just general understanding. All right, fantastic. Well, I really appreciate folks uh, taking the time to uh, talk about what your barriers are. So, you know, what we plan to do today is hopefully uh, talk about some tools to address some of those barriers. And then also just recognizing that those are so many barriers, um, really diving in on a few and um, what potentially you know, NCSP could be doing to help facilitate um, solutions to those barriers. So if we can go to the, the next slide. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the National Community Solar Partnership is for those of you who are new. Um, so NCSP was created under the Obama administration, but was funded under the last administration during FY19. So it has been um, in, in, in the works for the last couple of years, with, really with the goal of um, creating a coalition of community stakeholders all working together to expand access to affordable community solar um, to every US household. Um, and then also really enabling and realizing those externalities of benefits. So uh, increased resiliency, energy burden reduction and workforce development. And so what is the National Community Solar Partnership? What has it been doing over the last few years? Um, it is a, a strong network of over 600 individuals and almost 500 organizations. There is an online platform that Anna will go over shortly um, uh, where we are engaging folks on a daily basis, sharing events, asking questions, sharing resources, and it's not just us. And that's what I want to be really clear about. It's not just us sharing events and us sharing resources, but it's a really active community that is sharing resources that they have created, stories that they have, um, uh, of projects they have put together, events that they are hosting. And so I think that's a really important element. Um, another piece is that we have launched a new campaign and so we're spotlighting projects. And so it's just a really active forum and we wanna to continue to grow that. Um, you know, as part of that, we really want to make sure that we're continuing to collaborate. And so the forum being one of them, that online platform, but these types of convenings being another way that we are able to collaborate together, uh, share information, hear from you, 
um, what what are your needs um, in, in, in the community solar space? And then the other sort of big element to what NCSP is, um, is our technical assistance arm. And that is um, where we've done three rounds to date and we officially announced earlier this week that our technical assistance program is rolling. And so Greg will go through that full process um, and talk in specifics about um, the types of technical assistance that we are providing um, or can provide um, and what that process is to go ahead and, and access that, that technical direct technical assistance. Also, another form of technical assistance is through collaboratives. And so when we get a lot of folks that are in that same sort of stakeholder group or similar barrier, we have created collaboratives that um, bring those peers together to really help learning. Right now we have two collaboratives, one in multifamily affordable housing and another one specific to municipal utilities. And we're really exploring um, what, what are sort of those next collaboratives that we should be um, supporting moving forward. And that really does um, lend to the community engagement piece of us having these types of conversations, many one-on-one -on -one conversations. We had a red quest for information earlier this year, um, and we're creating all types of external summary documents on those conversations, um, really to make sure that folks know that we heard them and we wanna continue those conversations. Um, and last but not least, you know, we, we are really digging in on what is next for NCSP and really wanting to be thoughtful about solutionizing sort of tools, resources, and initiatives to um, address a number of those barriers that we continue to hear over and over again. So if you can go to the next slide, I will quickly run through that knowing that we have a tight agenda. Um, I've mentioned the rolling technical assistance program. One thing we've heard time and time again is um, the regulatory environment at the state level and that needing to be um, uh, like, you know, welcoming to community solar. And we are looking to do best practice sharing, peer learning and provide technical assistance and already had um, state convenings um, with folks at the state level and how we can best support them to create the best types of programming um, across the United States. As you probably know, 39 states plus the District of Columbia have uh, community solar programming, but we wanna make sure that it's available in all states and territories, as well as in a way that is um, most accessible to everyone. Uh, we are all on, we're also launching a new initiative called the Credit Ready Solar Program. And the idea here is to provide standardization, coordination, and technical assistance in, in that sort of gap of um, capacity building and pre-development needs uh, for, for, for community-based organizations and smaller developers as they're getting their project to become credit ready and connect it to the right lending institutions and right capital stack to make their project work. Um, so stay tuned on more information about that initiative. Uh, we also have heard time and time again that in the low income customer space that support is needed in acquisition and management. Um, so we're being incredibly thoughtful on leveraging existing low income programming to identify customers and build out tools for better management of those customers. And then last but not least, we're also being incredibly thoughtful about the hearts and minds piece. Um, I mentioned the campaign around project spotlights called Moment in the Sun, um, where we are, uh, you know, telling the stories of different projects all over the country, um, particularly with that community-based focus. And then also looking to partner with organizations for information sharing and consumer protection purposes. So next slide. Really quickly, um, this is gonna tee up sort of some of the conversations around what we can do. So um, like our, the Solar Technologies Office really does have substantial resources, but it's also sort of, it's also limited. And so just, I, I wanna go through what we can do and what we cannot do just so that we're all on the same page moving forward. So CEDO can provide funding through competitive funding opportunities, um, both 
prizes and singular opportunities or through the labs, um, primarily for research development, as well as technical assistance, education and outreach, and some of our workforce programming. Um, we're able to convene stakeholders, establish goals and priorities, and really amplify key messages. We can also um, create those tools I mentioned, reports and other resources needed, um, collect data and, and provide that analysis needed to be successful. What we cannot do is set legislative priorities, make regulatory changes and determine state and local policies. So need to be really clear, we cannot do those things. We cannot provide funding to entities outside of competitive processes um, or fund awards to do things outside the scope of what they were already awarded to do. And then last but not least, um, we, are, we cannot fund programming in perpetuity. Um, the ideal situation is that programming can be replicated um, and continued beyond our funding period. So with that, um, let's go to the next slide. We're gonna take another really quick poll. So we wanna see, um, this is gonna be a pop-up poll, so it's a Zoom poll. Um, everyone should see the box in front of them. Are you a member of NCSP? Yes, no, not yet, or not sure. Take a minute to um, see the results of that poll. Jackie, I'm not sure if you need to go to the next slide to see that. So if we're just um, waiting a couple more seconds to give everyone a chance to answer, but I'll um, show the results in a second. Great. All right, so we have a good majority that are already in CSP members. Um, and then no, not yet, 33%. So I would encourage um, the 33% and the not sure to um, uh, determine whether or not you are. And uh, Robin Burton from NREL just dropped the link into the chat on, um, uh, on how to join the National Community Solar Partnership. So if you have not yet joined, please do take advantage of that. Um, all right, and so let's go to the next slide quickly. Um, and I wanna take this moment to introduce Shalonda Baker. She is the Secretarial Advisor on Equity and the Deputy Director for Energy Justice at the Department of Energy. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Shalonda for some brief remarks. Thank you so much, Shalonda. Oh, absolutely, Nicole. I love this meeting and um, I already know it's gonna be great. I also recognize a few names and not faces since not too many people are on camera, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, but it's good to see all of you. I'm gonna share just a handful of slides. Um, I know you all have a packed agenda and I don't wanna take up too much time. Um, see. Okay. So as Nicole said, and I'm sure, I think everyone can see that. So um, and can you give me a sense? Okay, great. So as Nicole said, I am the Deputy Director for Energy Justice. I'm also the Secretary's Advisor on Equity, which means that I talk to the Secretary and um, about a lot of equity issues and lead um, the execution of a handful of executive orders related to equity, and there are many, um, but I will focus today on Executive Order 14008, which is tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. And the particular provision of that executive order is Section 223, which outlines the Justice 40 initiative. And so I want to just ground us in this particular moment. Um, you know, this slide has been timely, I think, for the last two years or so. Um, we've been reckoning with racial inequality and structural inequality across so many dimensions of our society. Um, and the work that I did before joining DOE was to really examine racial and structural inequality within the energy system. And I, I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but there are many inequities to highlight. Um, we know that communities of color are exposed to more pollution than they um, create. We also know that those problems are structural and a part of the system. These are not accidental this is a result of the policies that we have enacted and the choices that we've made in terms of energy development. 
We also know that issues of energy burden and energy insecurity are pervasive. And so, again, I know I'm speaking to a pretty sophisticated audience here, but just for level setting, energy burden is the overall amount of, um, of income that one pays to meet energy needs. And energy insecurity is just lacking reliable access to uninterrupted energy sources. And these two things are linked, um, which is to say that the higher your energy burden, the more likely you are to experience energy insecurity. And the national average is around 3% for energy burden. Um, but we know that communities of color uh, and low-income communities are paying upwards of 10, 20, and sometimes even higher um, to 10 or 20% of overall income. Uh, to meet their energy needs. So um, we here at DOE are studying that issue and you know we know that about a third of households report energy insecurity fairly routinely. When we drill down on the numbers, we see that Black and Latinx households are experiencing energy insecurity um, in extraordinary ways. And to me, this slide is always so stark because it's, it's about people's lived experiences. Um, energy insecurity is not uh, just, you know, oh, I couldn't pay my bill today. It's about, you know, the stress of disconnection. It's a matter of life and death in some cases. And the, the image on the right is from Detroit. People are making choices about whether or not to heat and cool their home. And it's all, again, linked to the structure and design of our energy system. We also know that these same communities, so communities that are burdened by pollution, communities where energy burden is high and energy insecurity is high, are also less resilient. So this is these are places where the grid itself um, needs to be upgraded, where power outages are, are prevalent. And this is an image here from the power outage in um, during the deep freeze back in February. On the left side is the east side of uh, Austin, my hometown. On the right is the west side. And the west side is where the university is and more affluent communities on the left. Um, is East Austin, and that is a predominantly Black and Latinx community. And so, um, again, these communities are shouldering many of the economic and environmental burdens of our, of our system. And again, none of this is accidental. So the question that I am working on in my office is how do we do, engage in transformation, right? How do we simultaneously transform the energy system and ensure that it's equitable and just? And luckily, um, I sit in an office that is tailor-made for this particular moment. So this is a lot of words on a slide, but <laughs> essentially I sit in the office of um, minority economic impact or economic impact and diversity. And our office um, was charged in the 1970s with advising the secretary on the effective energy policies on communities of color, as well as minority business entities. Our office was also tasked with working with the Energy Information Administration, and they do the survey that I referenced in one of the prior slides. They do the Residential Energy Consumption Survey. But our office is tasked with partnering with them to really um, figure out how to engage uh, communities and, and what types of policies and programs are uh, prohibiting full access to the energy system and equitable access to the energy system. Our office is also charged with developing and recommending programs for communities of color and assessing energy burdens on communities of color, as well as um, providing energy-related technical assistance and job creation. Um, this office has been around since the 70s, and I'm really excited to be a part of this team because we have not fully lived into the all aspects of this mandate, and I think there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, and we are now in an historic moment where the president has made equity a, a, a centerpiece of this country's energy policy. And as I mentioned, um, he announced the Justice 40 Initiative in Executive Order 14008, tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. And for those of you who don't yet know about this historic initiative, let me just get, again, give an overview. This is the promise to commit 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments to disadvantaged communities. And that's the term used in the actual executive order. We know that disadvantaged communities are those overburdened and under-resourced communities, those environmental justice communities, as well as communities that are transitioning away from dependence on fossil fuels. So DOE is all wrapped up in Justice 40. So the types of investments highlighted here are investments in clean energy and energy efficiency, clean transit and affordable and sustainable housing, training and workforce development, and the remediation and reduction of legacy pollution, as well as clean water infrastructure investments. So um, we have such an opportunity with Justice 40. It is going to be our pathway. 
um, that will provide for equitable deep sea carbonization and transform and build wealth um, in underserved, overburdened communities. Okay, let's keep moving. And just to give a little bit of an academic gloss to this, um, how do we how do we engage in this work? We know that it's it's going to require culture change from the inside and out. And our team is so delighted to work with CETO and also the National Community Solar Partnership to think through issues of distributive or distributional justice to engage communities at every stage of the development cycle, and that's procedural justice, to ensure that we understand where communities are coming from um, as we engage them with DOE programs and new energy policy um, initiatives that uh, will be coming out. So that's recognition justice. And then at the bottom here is restorative justice, which is to say that we, and, and I in particular, really believe that energy um, policy and the energy transition can be our pathway to healing, to restoring um, justice to the communities that have been so harmed by the energy system to date. And so we have a handful of policy priorities, which again, link directly to the work that um, Nicole and her team are doing. We wanna decrease energy burden in disadvantaged communities. We also know from the research that communities of color have been left behind in the solar transition. And so we really wanna ensure that as we bring new technologies online, there is parity in majority black and brown census tracts relative to majority white census tracts. We also know that access to capital is a problem. And I saw that in the, the slide earlier, many of you say capital, capital, capital is a problem. We wanna hack that. Um, we are also um, dedicated to increasing enterprise or creating enterprises in um, disadvantaged communities and increasing jobs in those communities, as well as deepening the resilience and including folks in the process, which is energy democracy. And I know many of you are no stranger to that overall term. So um, we've got a lot to do um, and, you know, I'm up for it and I'm really delighted to work with Nicole and her team and the rest of the CETO team um, on this historic initiative. So thanks so much. Thanks so much, Londa. I really appreciate your time and um, partnership on the, the National Community Solar Partnership. So many partnerships, so many communities, um, but it's such an important piece of the puzzle. So thanks again, and we will absolutely continue this conversation. Um, so with that, we're gonna transition over to um, Anna Balzer, uh, who is the Stakeholder Engagement Coordinator for the National Community Solar Partnership, is gonna go through our online platform and new website. So take it away, Anna. Great, thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you again to Shalanda. So great to have your perspective um, and your presence here at this meeting. Um, I'm gonna briefly go over two of the resources that the National Community Solar Partnership has um, and then I'm actually gonna turn it over to one of our existing partners to talk about them in a little bit more depth. Um, so if you can go to the next slide, Jackie, we'll start with the, our sort of public facing resource, which is our website. And I'm really excited to introduce our brand new website. We just launched it this week. Um, and this website is a collaborative effort between the National Community Solar Partnership and the Office of Economic Impact and Diversity, really trying to elevate the importance of community solar as a resource for increasing equitable access to clean energy. So we encourage you to go check out this new site. That is the new address up at the top there. Um, and we will send this link in any follow-up emails as well so you can go take a look. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit more about what's on this site and how to use it. Um, so Jackie, if you can go to the next slide. We have a lot of the same features from our old site. Um, we have one of the most important ones, which is tracking sort of the community solar market in general and looking at the trends for community solar. So where do community solar projects exist? What is their capacity? How long have they been there? We're also tracking project affordability over time. Um, and we're also tracking um, the enabling legislation for community solar. And then what legislation also includes components for low and moderate income access to community solar. On the right side is a snapshot of our resources page, which is another um, sort of hallmark uh, component of our website, which is where we aggregate resources that we believe are the most helpful to um, those that are developing community solar. And we try to categorize these um, to make them really accessible so you know what you're looking for. I do wanna highlight that there are even more resources available to you when you do join to become a partner on our online platform, um, but we have sort of our top level resources on the page here. 
Um, we also have information about our partners. So who is a part of the partnership? Where are they located and what do they do? Again, that's something that you get even more of when you join the partnership. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in just a moment. And then some new pieces I wanna highlight are our blog. So we have a new blog page where as Nicole mentioned, we're really trying to lift up the stories of community solar and how we're, um, community solar is innovating around typical barriers to accessing clean energy, um, especially for low and moderate income customers. Um, and then we have a new page on our technical assistance program, which really dives into how you can apply, um, how to become eligible, what we cover. Um, and Greg is gonna talk a lot about that later on. So I will um, brush over that for now. But at the moment, if we can go to the next slide, we wanna take another very brief poll to understand from you sort of what sort of resources, um, what types of resources would be the most helpful to you in terms of advancing your community solar work. So we know that the resources are only as valuable as they are accessible and usable. So it's important to us to really have a pulse on sort of what are those most useful resources and how can we be making this information more accessible to you all. So I'll just wait for a brief moment while everyone responds. And this is a multiple choice answer. So if you see more than one on there that you love, feel free to click it. If you don't see one on there that you would like to lift up, please put it in the chat. All right, I think we're slowing down. So let's look at our results. So seeing a lot of interest in case studies, workbooks and toolkits, um, and then some more interest in interactive web pages, tip sheets, research papers and webinars. Um, thank you again for those that are adding things into the chat. Uh, again, we have our public facing website that hosts some of these resources but we're able to do it in an even more collaborative way on sort of our second resource, which is the one I wanna dig into a little bit more here. Um, Jackie, if you can advance the slide, um, which is our online platform. So our online platform is what you get access to when you join the partnership. So I think several times Robin um, from NREL has dropped the chat, uh, dropped the link in the chat to join the partnership. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about what's on the other side of that link when you register. So the big piece here is peer networking. So what we're doing today, convening everyone, is a great start at getting some of these conversations rolling. But we're really excited about this platform in particular because it's a place where those conversations can continue. So as Nicole mentioned, there are a lot of opportunities to do this. Um, you can post discussion questions directly on the forum. You can respond to discussion questions that someone else has posted. You can promote your own event um, or access events that other organizations are hosting. You can make requests for resources. So again, we're really engaged on this site, but so are other organizations that are looking to do research or really answer some of these tough questions about community solar. And then we're doing a lot of spotlighting of projects that are you know, innovating around barriers to community solar and trying to be really realistic about some of those challenges that projects are facing and how they're getting around them. And then a really great uh, benefit is direct messaging. So we have a lot of partners here and once you become a partner, you have access to connecting with them directly. Um, on that note, I wanna talk a little bit more about those partners themselves. So Jackie, if you can go to the next slide, please. So who are the partners that are part of the National Community Solar Partnership? As Nicole mentioned, we have over 600 partners. Actually, as of today, we have 657 partners as a part of the partnership. Um, they represent over 440 organizations and we're closing in on getting all 50 states, territories and the District of Columbia um, as a part of our partnership. Perhaps some of you can help us out today. Um, but I also wanna talk about who these partners are, where they come from, and they really come from a really large diversity of stakeholder groups. And that's part of what makes this partnership so powerful. So lots of different representatives in this space, including solar developers, researchers in community solar, state and local government, representatives from public utility commissions, financers of com uh, community solar utilities, and then importantly, communities and community groups and nonprofits that are working on addressing these issues as well. And again, when you are a part of the partnership, you are a part of this conversation that includes all of these stakeholders, and you have the access to be able to ask questions and get responses from a variety of perspectives. Uh, and as Nicole mentioned, 
when there is uh, coalescing around certain barriers or interests, we can form collaborative groups that meet um, in small groups and really start to tackle some of these common barriers. Um, so with that, I actually want to highlight how the partnership has sort of um, given birth to some of these conversations that have happened at the smaller level. And I actually want to introduce uh, one of our partners, Lynn Benander, who I believe is on the line. Um, Lynn Benander is the president and CEO of Co-op Power, which is a multi-race, multi-class network of local energy cooperatives and a movement for a sustainable and just energy future. She has helped build community-owned businesses across the Northeast, bringing quality jobs, sustainable products and services, and valuable assets to local communities. Lynn has been a member of the National Community Solar Partnership since May of 2020 and was instrumental in the formation of the partnership's financing community-owned solar community of practice, which is a member-led initiative to connect and support organizations seeking to develop community-owned solar. So Lynn, I will turn it over to you to talk a little bit about your experience in the partnership and how the partnership helped you create this community of practice. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you, Nicole, for um, having us here. Um, we, we found that this partnership portal was incredibly valuable in, in allowing us to connect with like-minded uh, people that were interested in what it would be like to um, create a whole infrastructure that supported community ownership of solar. And so we um, just called one initial meeting and got a big response. And then um, since then, up until about two months ago, we've been having monthly meetings. And um, at the second meeting, um, the group said, we need a community of practice around this. And so um, we set up with a group of volunteers to, um, to organize those monthly meetings and um, brainstorm, like, what is it that we really want community ownership to bring? Does it, does it matter if it's community owned? What if it's just bringing, maximizing community benefit? And we identified all the ways where community ownership actually brings more benefits and brings them in a more reliable way, in a way that's um, um, more empowering to communities. Uh, but that was just one example that we did with a great group brainstorm. But we brought in um, 60, more than 60 people to our community practice. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to um, starting up our a, a webinar series um, and uh, engaging in more conversation about why community ownership is important and how we can work together to create the funding mechanisms that are required, especially for pre-development and for sponsor equity um, in order to uh, make sure that uh, community ownership is attainable. But the platform has been a perfect place for us to um, be able to be in contact with all the other um, groups that are interested in uh, in, in this kind of activity. So we're, we're very grateful for having access to the partnership to reach out to so many people. Great, thank you so much, Lynn, for um, sharing your experience. And again, I just wanna highlight that the partnership um, does allow for these conversations to turn into more than just a discussion, but really working groups, community of practices, collaboratives, and they really do help inform the work that we do as a program and the future direction um, for the office. So with that, I will turn it back over to Nicole for the next part of our conversation. Thanks so much, Anna. And thank you again, Lynn. Um, we're in, uh, super grateful for your leadership on the platform and the work that you were doing focused on community owned community solar. And we really see that as an important element to the overall success of not only community solar as a business model, but really driving down to those meaningful benefits that we are hoping to achieve through energy burden reduction, um, resiliency, uh, and, and wealth creation at the community level. So thanks again. Um, with that, we'll go to the next slide. And we are just a couple of minutes over, but I think we can stay on time. So we're gonna take the next 10 to 15 minutes um, to break out into discussion groups. And here, um, folks will have an opportunity to introduce yourself again, um, but in person this time with a much smaller group. Um, so we'll have groups of about 10 each. Um, but the thing I want folks to really think about is if funding 
<laughs> and, and I laugh a little bit because, uh, you know, I, I recognize that this is, you know, sort of the number one major need and we, and we hear you and um, we, I, I, I think I want to make sure folks know that this is absolutely on our radar and we're thinking about how to continue to unlock um, those financial resources that folks so desperately need. But if you, if that funding was available, um, to your community today. We're really curious for the conversation of how do you plan on um, supporting and or leading um, that rapid development and operation of community-based community solar projects and what resources, tools, expertise um, do you need from DOE um, in that interim to provide to your um, organization or community um, to help you really be ready. Um, so with that, we're going to break out into groups for about 10 minutes and we'll come back and uh, dive into the, the rolling TA um, programming. So see everyone soon. I know that that. All right, we're also now being recorded again. Um, welcome back, everyone. I hope that um, conversation felt um, helpful and uh, you were able to connect to peers um, in the space and um, I really think that we could have absolutely continued that conversation and really started to roll up our sleeves and dive into the weeds of you know like what exactly do we mean about um, you know case study resources and um, uh, research and analysis and what else can we do to really help facilitate um, uh, partnerships um, and be that convener for different types of financing uh, uh, opportunities, whether it be um, through banks and other lending institutions and or philanthropic um, providers. So I hope people found that helpful. And um, I let me just do a quick time check. It is 3.02. So we're going to take a super quick break, just recognizing that two hours is a long time. Um, we're actually going to shorten that just by th two minutes. So if everyone can be back um, at 3.05, um, we will dive into the next section. So see everybody in three minutes. that that networking and peer learning is one of the most valuable tools of the National Community Solar Partnership. So to continue these conversations and start others, we do encourage folks to join the partnership and Robin will go ahead and, and drop that link into the chat if you missed it earlier. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce um, Greg Laventis over at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, who is the Technical Assistance Coordinator for um, NCSP. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Greg. Thanks so much, Nicole. I appreciate that. Uh, as Nicole said, I'm Greg Laventis. I coordinate the Technical Assistance, or TA, for National Community Solar Partnership. And I'm really excited to have a chance to talk to you all about our TA offering. Uh, so next slide, please. Now, to help you get a sense of what's on offer and what that could be like for you and your organization and your project, I'm going to first give you an overview of the NCSP TA. Second of all, I'm going to tell you how to apply. Third, I'm going to introduce you to some of the subject matter experts that are there to help. And then we'll hear from a few of the folks who are receiving TA right now uh, or have recently finished up a project. And then finally, hopefully, uh, we'll have a little time to take some questions from, from you all, questions from me, questions from the providers, of the partners, who are TA recipients. And hopefully uh, in the breakout sessions, I was very impressed. Nicole uh, had 20 seconds to get a point across and she ended exactly on time. So I'm gonna try to follow her lead. Uh, so next slide, please. First, we're gonna have uh, this overview. Next slide. And first things first, uh, to be eligible to apply for and receive TA, you must, one, uh, be an NCSP partner. Now, if you're not a partner yet, it's really easy to register. You just go to this link and fill out a few questions about you and your organization. Then second, 
uh, individuals have to be citizens or permanent res residents of the US and organizations have to be legally formed in the US and maintain a primary place of business in the US. Then finally, uh, the application cannot be for work that is being funded through another grant, um, for example, like uh, by another DOE program. So now on to the TA itself. Uh, next slide, please. Now, there are a number of subject matter areas that we can provide help with, and they fit into sort of five broad categories. So first you have uh, policy leg legislation and regulation research in here. This is to help navigate existing re regulations. I, I heard a number of folks on the, on the breakout talk about regulations being uh, difficult. They also uh, talk about um, incorporating resilience here. This is in a policy context. Then we have project financing analysis. And we've got a lot of different things that fit under here. So cost benefit analysis, subscription structures, financing considerations, and modeling incentive structures for low and moderate income communities. Then we have outreach and, engage and engagement strategies. And this is outreach to, uh, for example, governments, utilities, and low income households. Next slide, please. Then the final two buckets are program design, which, you know, this is a very broad category. You've got customer acquisition, subscriber management, billing, uh, program and project evaluation, project planning and development, incorporating resiliency into projects and programs, uh, and then workforce development. I heard uh, folks uh, definitely talked about that on the breakout as well. And then finally, there are the technical issues. So quantifying and identifying co-location benefits that community solar can provide, integration with other technologies like microgrids or battery storage, and then finally, solar modeling and analysis. And for example, here, uh, like distri distribution system modeling. Next slide, please. Now, this is these are some of the types of, of TA that are available. So this is what some of those subject matter areas look like uh, when they're applied to a project. So you can have consultations on the program processes, um, presentations on things like trends and issues or whatever else it's going to be workshops and meeting facilitation, technical review of proposed plans or documents, uh, general uh, community solar information and education, analysis of things like cost, benefits, impact, uh, feasibility, um, exploratory and foundational research, and then data analysis and evaluation and modeling. So there are a lot of different formats that this can take and a lot of, you know, depending on the project, you might need one thing or another. We've got a lot of different things that we do here. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in a moment, I'm going to go over how to apply, but this is happen. This is what happens once you do apply. So first, you, you'll submit your application, and then next, the the NCSP team member, uh, the team is going to review the application and assign it to a technical assistance provider. And after that, the provider is going to reach out to you and work with you to scope out your TA work. And then finally, you'll start the work together. Um, now, as Nicole mentioned, previously we were taking applications in rounds about every six months, and now we are very happy to offer TA on a rolling basis. So now folks can submit applications at their own pace and when they have particular needs uh, for technical assistance. So you can submit your application at any time. Next slide, please. This is, this is the criteria, the review criteria that we use. So the three criteria, uh, first is that it's, um, uh, that the request is well-defined, forward-looking, specific, and within the scope of the programs is focused on community solar. Um, and then the, the requester is well-positioned to address the challenge. So they've also identified any partners that they're gonna need. Um, and I will stress that we do want these to be as specific as possible. That's very helpful. So what, what we're looking for from applicants is something along the lines of, this is a challenge we're having. Uh, for example, we want more uptake from low-income participants, and we think our subscription structure might be the problem. Um, can you review our subscription structure and make recommendations uh, to change it and help us increase our low-income participation? So something very specific like that. Next, um, the TA uh, is the impacts and re replicability. So the TA will have 
a, uh, we want the TA uh, request to be something that's going to have a significant impact on the project that it's informing. And it's also great if, the, if it's the type of thing that could be useful for other projects. So for example, we have one project now uh, for Public Utilities Commission in which NREL is doing research on the administrative costs for community solar programs across the country so that the appropriate fee levels can be determined. And this could be, as you can see, you know, you can imagine that this could be helpful for other jurisdictions uh, that would like to set up a community solar program and want to understand that. And then finally, alignment with the NCSP goals. And the overarching goal, of course, is expanding solar access to all Americans, um, but specifically making community solar affordable and accessible, and then ensuring that communities realize all of the community solar benefits. Now, I'm going to tell you how to apply, uh, but first, we have another poll. This is thinking about your organization and community. Um, what, you know, what area could you use technical assistance in? And Jackie, I will let you be the judge of when we, uh, when most folks have, have answered this. Sounds good, yes. we'll give it another 30 seconds or so. Great, thanks. In the meantime, Greg, there's a question in the chat um, from Sonia, and what's the turnaround time for a TA request? Yes, so we are trying to have our turnaround time in about two weeks. Um, that depends on, we're going to be checking uh, on them and reviewing them on, uh, if you can have them in on Wednesdays, uh, then we will be, we're reviewing them on Mondays and, and that turnaround time can be uh, right around two weeks. Um, if it's uh, turned in uh, after that, you would uh, consider that it's like turning it in the next Wednesday. Oh, wow. So the, every, everyone, uh, it seems quite um, pretty even uh, with technical issues uh, winning out by just a, a hair. Um, and then looks like outreach and engagement is very important, but also program, uh, program design and, and policy legislation and regulation um, with uh, financing analysis trailing a little bit. Um, so this is very interesting. Thanks so much for participating. And we've got this recorded, so that's great for us. So let's move on to applying. So how do you apply? Uh, next slide, please. Well, let me tell you. Um, applying for NCSP TA is three simple steps. Uh, register to become a partner. Two, log into the, to the online platform. And three, complete the application and submit it. Uh, so next slide, please. The first thing to do is to register. So you go to this link, and I, I know you can't uh, click it here, but this deck will be available later, and you can you can get the, the link then. Um, registering is really quick and easy, like I said earlier. There are a few questions about yourself and your organization, as you can see here. Um, and, then, uh, and, and then you just uh, hit register, and then you can, next step, uh, next slide, please. And you can go to the next step, which is, logging in. So once you're registered, just log into the online platform. Anna talked about the online platform earlier, and you go to the resources tab. So this, this uh, thing you see on the left here is the home page that you'll see. And if you look up in the top here with the, uh, there won't be a, a red circle surrounding it, but you see it here, the resources tab. When you click on that, you'll see this second page on the right here. And if you just scroll down a little bit, you see this, um, Quick links, you go down to this quick, quick links and the first link is the application. If you click that, it will take you directly to the application. Uh, next slide, please. And then once you're in the application, it looks like this, this is the, the beginning and then this is the, some of the questions. Um, and then this is submitting it if you're going from left to right here. Um, you, you complete a few questions about yourself and about your organization and then about what your request is. And remember, please be as specific as you can, uh, particularly about what you need uh, TA providers to do for you. So next 
Next slide, please. Now, speaking of providers, uh, next slide again, please. So the providers are from my lab, Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, the National uh, Renewable Energy Lab, or NREL, and then we have a number of third-party subject matter experts. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the third-party uh, providers that we have. It's an expanding group. And so that you can have a better sense of who helps NCSP partners uh, with technical assistance, several of the third-party uh, subject matter experts have been good enough to join us today. I really appreciate it. We've, had, we've got Jill Clyburn of Clyburn Associates, Jason Keyes and David Woolley of Keyes and Fox, Ted Redman of Pale Blue Dot, and Nicole Sitaraman and Victor Rojas of Sustainable Capital Advisors. And again, this is just a few of the folks who provide TA, so it's just a taste of all the providers, but each of them is going to introduce themselves and their companies, talk about their areas of expertise, maybe share some of the work that they've done for uh, the NCSP. And if uh, everyone puts their Zoom on speaker format, if you go up to the right with your cursor, you'll see uh, the view icon. And if you click on that, you should have the option to hit side-by-side -side speaker. Uh, if you click that, you'll be able to see who's talking. So you can match a, a, a face to the name. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, so let's start with Jill. Hey, thanks, Greg. Uh, it's a little nervous making going first with this, but uh, a brief summary of what my team uh, can do as a technical assistance provider. Um, I'm Jill Clyburn, uh, president of Clyburn Associates. I've been working nationally from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and um, I've been leading TA support um, with a team, a uh, couple of other associates of mine uh, that are expert in best practice, community-focused solar program design, market research and marketing, policy, process innovation, including stakeholder inclusion, workforce development, and improving economic impacts overall and for specific communities. Um, we're also leaders on integrated solar plus and in coaching community focused innovators. So I imagine most of you think, wow, that's like a whole universe. Um, where do we go from here? Well, um, because of our individual experience, I would say that we may be a go-to team for projects involving um, electric co-ops and public power utilities, CCAs, some indigenous projects. Um, we've worked with state agencies, IOUs, nonprofits that face challenges aligning JEDI goals with old rules and structures. Um, in general, I'm most interested in knowing where people are feeling stuck so we can focus on getting you unstuck. Um, while the experts on our team do cutting edge economics and pricing analysis, we guide you through the analytic process so that you can use it, articulate it, and replicate it. Um, one example comes to mind just earlier this week, we had a great work session with a co-op that's launching its second community solar project, emphasizing LMI. Um, I'm working with Christian, an uh, analyst from my team, to help the co-op understand the economics from both the utility side and the customer side. Um, subsidized subscribers and unsubsidized subscribers. So this last week, we kind of came to a breakthrough point where we're innovating a rate that can accelerate the benefits to the LMI participate, participants, and they can also leverage energy efficiency savings. So I think that's the kind of thing that gets very exciting. Um, on another project, I've been working with a state agency to refine its community solar out, outreach, including facilitating LMI involvement, and then working to fit some of those round safe, shaped solutions into square shaped agency holes. So that's you know trying to help with this transformation by helping with relationships. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about my associates. Um, I've already mentioned Christian, who's a, a top-notch analyst. Recently, I've been working with Gilbert Mihoud, who moved from Ohio University to the University um, in Chicago, Loyola University. 
And he's been working on uh, collaborating with some of the leading community solar programs and doing best practice research, um, things like job impacts, economic impacts. Uh, we've also worked with Kathy Swartz, who is uh, recently transitioned from being the CEO of Solar Energy International. She is a workforce wizard um, on training, community-based NGO development, things like that, uh, working with disadvantaged communities and bringing them into training. Um, I'm also keenly interested in projects that cross technical and institutional barriers, um, such as for the last, oh golly, five or six years, I've been working on um, increasing the value of community solar programs by doing an integrated approach with utilities and also solar plus storage, um, initially for electric co-ops applicable to other utilities uh, at anything at the distribution uh, interconnection scale. And so Jill, uh, Jill, that's sorry. probably the end of my time, right, Greg? Yeah, unfortunately, we're running a little bit behind. Um, yeah, I'll, I hate to, also, hate to, I'll put yeah. a uh, link up so people could look us up further. I hope that you get a general idea. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much. I appreciate it. And I will turn it over to Jason Keyes and David Woolley of Keyes and Fox. And sorry, we are a little bit behind, so uh, Thanks, Greg. can't give you as much time as, as uh, I had promised. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. I'll try and keep it short. Um, am I coming through okay? Great. Um, so I'm a co-founder of Keys and Fox, which is a law firm started in 2008. Uh, we have offices in Denver and San Francisco. We've got 16 attorneys. Um, we've worked on regulatory matters related to renewable energy especially distributed generation in uh, over 40 states. We've done lots and lots and lots of net metering rulemakings and interconnection rulemakings and utility rate cases. And those, especially net metering and utility rate cases, especially in the past few years, have dealt with a lot of community solar issues and uh, low income issues. Uh, so we're broadly experienced in that. Um, because of all the work we've done on the regulatory front, we work with a lot of solar developers. So we do transactional work, you know, like the power purchase agreements, um, engineering procurement construction agreements, site leases, roof leases. Um, and for, uh, for the NCSP, uh, we've been a TA in this program and in the past program, we've worked with teams in Michigan and Tennessee, and New York, Michigan, Oregon, um, a lot of that has been research on uh, what's allowed and what could be allowed uh, in those states and um, what needs to change in order to make community solar work in those states, then structuring programs and, uh, and you know, we're a law firm, so we do a fair amount of work on the document side. Um, so coming up with a power purchase agreement that's going to work to allow a community solar structure with uh, subscribers. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Jason. I appreciate that. And I will turn it over to Ted Redmond from Pale Blue Dot. Hello, I am uh, Ted Redmond. Uh, I'm an architect and an urban planner uh, located here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, I work with Pale Blue Dot. We're a small urban planning and consultancy firm. Uh, we focus on uh, climate planning, uh, energy planning, and renewable energy uh, services. Within the uh, renewable energy realm, uh, we are kind of a utility infielder, uh, which is pretty common for architects. We're an inch deep, a mile wide kind of people. <laughs> uh, we do everything from uh, site feasibility, site design, concept development, and procurement on specific sites. We also do group purchasing campaigns. Uh, we've done solar training, uh, particularly training for design professionals, but we've done some training for uh, general public. Uh, we do solar education uh, and communications and marketing support. Uh, we also uh, help design uh, solar and renewable energy policies and ordinances. So doing research, uh, policy development and uh, execution and management even for municipalities and uh, entities, you know, uh, uh, um, colleges and such. Uh, Within the NCSP program itself, um, we've um, 
done a number of things. We've done site-specific uh, design feasibility assessments and concept development for arrays on rooftops and ground mounts, but also uh, over parking areas, you know, structured elements over parking areas or over uh, open space. Uh, we've done uh, floating solar. Uh, we've also done some energy portfolio design uh, where we were exploring and designing a portfolio that would include solar as well as hydro um, and utility scale uh, energy storage for a resilient renewable energy system. Uh, we've done uh, production and financial modeling, so development performance and uh, exploring how a project will uh, ultimately work and helping to work through those details. Uh, we've also done program design. Uh, so we've helped both municipalities as well as nonprofits uh, design uh, research, uh, explore, identify, and design uh, studies to advance uh, both you know, solar adoption community-wide, but also solar uh, uh, concepts specific to advancing the benefits for low-income communities, for instance. Um, and uh, we're currently right now working with a group in uh, launching uh, one of those programs uh, right now. So that's uh, Pale Blue Dot in uh, kind of a nutshell, and I'll give a link to our website. Uh, thanks, Ted. I appreciate it. Um, and I will... Time dwindling, I'm going to turn it over to Nicole Sitaraman and Victor Rojas from Sustainable Capital Advisors. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nicole Sitaraman here. Um, I serve as Vice President of External Affairs and Policy at Sustainable Capital Advisors. Really excited to be a new member of the uh, technical assistance team um, for uh, the National Community Solar Partnership. Um, to give a little background on Sustainable Capital Advisors, we are a financial advisory and consulting firm uh, focused on developing innovative finance solutions for sustainable infrastructure. Uh, so the firm was started about 10 years ago by Trenton Allen uh, to serve as a conduit for connecting capital to climate solutions. Um, and we've worked with a whole uh, array of um, different um, players in the marketplace, including uh, municipalities, uh, state governments, um, utilities, clean energy providers, developers, uh, and community-based organizations. Um, and so we work with them to advise them on the financial pathways to getting sustainable infrastructure deployed. Um, the firm has um, over the years supported billion dollars, billions of dollars um, in client financings. Um, for a variety of clients and um, both uh, domestically and internationally. And we basically developed financial strategies to optimize uh, the flexibility and availability of capital for these projects. And um, in terms of the specific kind of um, suite of off offerings that, that we have, um, you know, they include financial modeling, feasibility studies, financial structuring, capital formation strategies, um, and also we have um, uh, expertise in, in policy anal analysis um, and community uh, engagement. Um, so the, the leads uh, for our work with uh, this program, um, of course, are uh, Trenton Allen, who is the CEO, um, and our senior vice president, Vic Rojas, who brings um, uh, many uh, decades of experience in climate finance, um, and energy equity, uh, Jerome Cox, who um, has a great deal of experience um, advising municipalities um, uh, from a municipal uh, financial advisor standpoint, and then Hannah Lenzel, who is our senior associate. Um, and we have a whole wonderful, amazing, bright uh, group of fellows who are excited uh, to help out in, in, in everything that we're working on. Um, so I will uh, stop there and I'm uh, really thrilled to, to, to be a new member of this team and looking forward to, to supporting um, um, all of you in, in the work that, that you're doing. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nicole, and thanks to uh, everyone. So obviously we have a lot of great expertise that's available to partners. And again, this is just some of the experts who are providing this TA. There, there are uh, more, and like I said, uh, it's an expanding field. 
Um, next slide, please. Finally, I, I did want to say that we wanted to have you all get a feel for what these technical assistance engagements look like. So we're honored to have four uh, TA recipients here to talk with us about their experience. And uh, if we have time directly following this, we will open it up to questions. Um, but I would like to welcome uh, Andy McDonald from Apogee, uh, Jane Leno from uh, Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, John Kench from Michigan Energy Op Options, and Dana Hardman uh, from the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute, or TEPRI. Um, and first, I think we will start with Andy. Uh, Andy's the director of Apogee, uh, Climate and Energy Transitions in Frankfort, Kentucky. Apogee provides technical assistance and education and advocacy to advance clean energy transition. In 2021, they published uh, the report, Local Solar, Local Savings, How to Cut Electricity Costs in Half for Public Schools and Local Governments in Frankfort, Kentucky. So I'd like to go to Andy first, and I'd, I want him to answer uh, three questions. One is, why did you request technical assistance from, uh, from the NCSP? Two is, what did you receive? And three is, where are you at now? So I will hand it over to you, Andy. Hi, Greg. Uh, thanks very much. I appreciate the invitation to talk with the group today, and I'm very appreciative for the technical assistance uh, we're receiving. So uh, we originally requested the technical assistance to help us with uh, the project that you mentioned. Um, we've proposed that a 20 megawatt solar facility be built uh, within our community in Frankfort, Kentucky, where we have a municipal utility and that it be located on the distribution grid of the local utility and that the energy would supply our uh, local governments and our public schools using a virtual net metering arrangement. Um, the technical assistance that we received initially, um, our focus was to get assistance developing a request for proposal that we would use for soliciting developers to build the proposed solar project. Um, however, after we started talking with the advisors from NREL um, and the, the NCSP, we uh, concluded that we needed some other help, help more immediately, which was uh, to help us respond to some of the utilities concerns about the project. And so uh, we switched gears and NREL has been helping us develop a dispatch model using their Engage modeling software. And the software um, models the uh, utility grid for the wholesale electric supplier that serves uh, Frankfurt as well as about eight other municipal utilities in Kentucky. And we're hoping uh, or expecting that the model will demonstrate the economic value of distributed solar. In, in particular, we're doing a number of scenarios in this model, um, including a base case, which is the status quo, and then a scenario using that would include this 20 megawatt solar project in Frankfurt, and another scenario that would put large uh, comparable, comparably sized so projects in some of the other communities served by this wholesale supplier. And we're hoping to find the, that there's economic value to the utility by having this, these distributed resources located on their grid. And also to be able to compare that to um, large, uh, to the difference that would make versus large centrally located uh, utility scale projects that are not on the distribution grids of any of the local utilities. In terms of where we are at now, um, the model is in the final stages of being set up, and we're hoping to begin running it in the next few days or week. And so we don't have results yet, um, but we're eagerly looking forward to seeing those results. Um, but we, we won't know what the outcome is until we see it. Uh, so that's all. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andy. I, I appreciate that. That's great. Um, Next, we have uh, Jane Lena from Massachusetts Clean Energy Center. Jane works for the Massachusetts uh, Clean Energy Center as a program administrator on, on 
solar programs. And prior to working at Mass uh, CEC, she worked for Solstice, where she developed uh, and managed partnerships with community-based organizations and businesses to help educate and enroll their networks in community solar. So I'm excited to have her. Again, uh, the questions are, why did you request TA? What did you receive? And where are you at now? So uh, take it away, Jane. Yeah, uh, thank you, Greg. Um, so at MassCEC, uh, we have a campaign for Massachusetts residents, which is online. It's a website called uh, Clean Energy Lives Here. Um, and we feature a bunch of clean energy technologies for Massachusetts residents and kind of give them uh, toolkits and guides to kind of help them access these technologies. And at the beginning of the year, we started developing a new community solar page for that campaign. Um, a lot of our clean energy technologies were kind of um, unfortunately more accessible to homeowners and we wanted to make sure to also put forward content that would be helpful to a broader group, including renters and low income residents and so community solar of course kind of like had that potential. And so we wanted to make sure that we were building out a page and a resource that would really be uh, helpful to uh, all Massachusetts residents. So as we were building out this community solar uh, resource page, we realized that there was very little information available to Massachusetts residents and at the state level about the kind of availability and prevalence of community solar in Massachusetts. So. We uh, took inspiration from other states and we talked uh, to the wonderful people at NYSERDA and the Rhode Island Office of Energy Resources who each kind of had developed their own resources on community solar, which also included maps of projects, um, a marketplace and things like that. And it inspired us to do something similar. And so our goal was really to give uh, Massachusetts residents a better idea of what community solar projects exist in Massachusetts, more specifically in their area and uh, how or where they might be able to enroll. Um, so our ideal situation is this you know, map that shows uh, all the community solar projects in Massachusetts and their details, uh, their, uh, whether you know, low-income residents can enroll, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the challenge is that in Massachusetts, we don't really have a clear way of tracking which community solar projects are being built or open to enrollment or who manages enrollment for a given solar farm and things like that. Um, they're all tracked through our smart data set, which is the current solar incentive program in Massachusetts. Um, so this data is available, but it's published online and not very easy to read or understand for um, Massachusetts residents or for anyone for that matter. So uh, we did some talking internally and uh, we understood that we needed help to use this data that we had available and translate it to something that uh, Massachusetts residents could use to understand uh, what community solar is around them in Massachusetts in their area um, and if they have options for enrolling or not. So that's the TA that we applied for and that we received. Um, this map is being built uh, in Tableau. We started working with Joyce McLaren at MRL and Dana Streit. Um, to kind of coordinate this and build this. And so they use this data set to build out this map of community solar projects in Massachusetts and Tableau. Um, and it's going to hopefully be ready in the next couple of weeks. It's going to be this interactive thing that we can have on our webpage, uh, also able to see it in mobile and things like that. And hopefully residents can click through and find either their town or a group of towns around them, their broader area, um, or the entire state or their utility territory, depending on kind of what they want to look at and see which community solar projects exist there. Um, and we provide them with different filters and information so they can see, for example, which projects have carve outs for low income residents. Uh, which projects 
are already online with notes that already projects that are already online might have limited options for enrollment and uh, we have projects that are coming online soon so more likely to be enrolling um, and it also includes more we're hoping to in, include more and more as we go on but there's also information like is the community solar what is where is it built is it built on a roof is it on a uh, is it on a green field or a brown field that kind of information uh, that residents might be interested in knowing so i think the last question is where we are at now so the map is being finalized uh, kind of like andy we're kind of in the few last days before we know what it what our final product kind of looks like um, so hopefully we'll have that in the coming weeks and we'll be able to uh, share that broad more broadly with massachusetts residents and anybody who's interested in in it um, we're really excited to share it we're really happy with the way it looks um, and we wouldn't have been able to do this ourselves and it was really helpful for us and I hope for uh, others too once it's published to have a way to really visualize this data set and understand this data set um, that otherwise necess wouldn't necessarily have been utilized like that. So we were really uh, grateful for the technical assistance that uh, we, we received to help make that happen. Great, thanks so much, Jane. That that's really exciting, and I, <clears throat> I look forward to seeing it as well. Um, so <clears throat> next is John Kench from <clears throat> excuse me from Michigan Energy Options. John directs the strategic and daily operations of Michigan Energy Options, which is a clean energy nonprofit that emphasizes innovative and collaborative projects between the public and private sectors, and among uh, several community solar projects. Uh, Michigan Energy Options has helped build one on capped landfill, which includes habitat restoration with native pollinators and plants. Uh, John is a U.S. Department of Energy Sunshot Advisor, a National Community Solar Partner, and a Municipal Certified Solar Expert by, by the National Renewable Energy Lab. So John, uh, why uh, did you request TA? What TA did you receive and where are you at now? Sure, thanks Greg. Can you hear me okay? I can. Super. Well, for the first, and thanks for having me, and thank you for the support with TA over the years. Well, the reason we request technical assistance from, from you folks is that I've been informally getting support from DOE and NREL for a number of years when I have questions and, and they provide information to us. So you guys are just, you know, the a font of information and a wonderful resource. And we oftentimes, we're a small nonprofit, we come up against questions that we ourselves can't answer. And so turning to the experts is, is what we do. Now we've re research, re, uh, received a couple rounds of TA. One, the initial round we received was, uh, we, we were put into a cohort of others who were looking for what we deemed as workarounds for community solar. In other words, we were in a situation where the incumbent utility didn't wanna see it, support it, or perhaps there were other barriers in our communities such as zoning and permitting. Um, there could have been some financial issues and there could be just also just a lot of community either indifference or actually in some rare cases, somebody not interested in seeing this in their community. And so by putting us in with that cohort, we were able to compare notes and also talk to Jenny Heater and others and become to understand that, you know, that unfortunately so many of the community solar projects are one-offs. They're kind of particular to where they're located, but we could also learn some techniques and some best practices from each other in order to kind of move forward our projects. Um, Mio and that particular Michigan Energy Options and that particular group posited a question that then led us to our second round of TA. And we were essentially wondering out loud, if you have an incumbent utility that does not want to have a community solar in their service territory. And the mechanism you wanted to use for that would be something where participants would invest in the front end and they would get an on-bill credit on their electricity bill as their return device, what could you do? And so we thought to ourselves, well, there's a number of things that municipalities control, you know, like property taxes that maybe could work out that way. And then we hit on this idea that oftentimes cities have water facilities, water authorities, water departments that they in fact control. So we floated this idea about what if we use the water facility 
the authority to actually provide us some kind of a mechanism for working out a program. And what happened next was that NREL connected us to um, Keys and Fox and David Woolley in particular, and David was wonderful. David and I spent lots of time on email and phone conversations with each other, trying to puzzle our way through this. We brought in people from his group, my group, um, even some national experts around this and just kind of really tried to get down to see if this could actually work out or not. And, and David, who I'm also in addition to, I'm working as an attorney and an energy expert, he also has an appointment at the Goldman School of Public Policy at Berkeley. And um, he's, he's very accomplished and very approachable. And he's recently finished a really excellent smart white paper on the topic. He really dug into this. And I hope, Greg, we might be able to make this available to others um, in, the, in the partnership so they can take a look at it. And essentially, not, not to be too reductive, but David's conclusion is, yeah, there, there is a chance we could get something like this to work somewhere. There seems to be some precedent out there, which lawyers always like. And there also seems to be some policies and laws that we could probably manipulate enough to make something like this work. And so what we're doing next or now is that David and I are working now to set up a national webinar kind of based upon his paper. We're gonna bring in some experts and have a conversation further about this with people. And, and again, just kind of see um, if we can test the waters, so to speak, with this idea. And then what I'm also trying to do because Michigan Energy Options is, we're more of an implement, implementer as a nonprofit. We're not really a policy shop per se. I wanna go out there and, and road test this. I wanna see if we can find a water authority somewhere in Michigan and I've got a couple I'm talking to or anywhere in the country, frankly, where we could set this up. We have a lot of expertise in solar. You mentioned um, one of our solar projects, we actually financed it, designed it, built it, owned and operated along with other partners, including Pivot Energy and, and others around um, the country. But we've gotten to know solar pretty well. We're the um, solar consultants for the state of Michigan right now. We think we can pull this off. And if we could pull it off, obviously what we would be doing is sharing what we've learned with others across the country that find themselves in a situation where they want to do community solar, but the electricity utility where they happen to be located doesn't want them to do it. Thanks. That, that's great, John. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Another uh, of, of, uh, exciting project. Um, and I look forward to, to hearing more about it. Um, as it go, as it continues, uh, the the stuff that you all are are continuing with it, um, but finally we have uh, Dana Harmon from the Texas Energy Poverty Research Institute or or TEPRI. Uh, Dana serves as executive director of of TEPRI in Austin. Uh, she's working to ensure radically evolving energy sector provides opportunities for underserved communities to thrive. Uh, leading collaborative efforts between industry, ac academia, and the social sector. Uh, Dana previously held leadership positions in multiple successful energy uh, technology startups after an early career in, in management consulting. She's Marshall Memorial Fellow of Joan and Marshall Fund of the US and a fellow of the University of Texas at Austin's Energy Institute. She serves as the chair of the City of Austin Resource Management Commission as well as uh, on the board of the Association of Women in Energy. So Dana, um, why did you request TA? What, did you, what TA did you receive and where are you out now? Thanks so much, Greg, and, and thank you to the NCSP for, for having me and, um, and for the, the fortune of the technical assistance. Um, our organization has actually had the, uh, been fortunate to have received two rounds of, of technical assistance uh, for our community solar project. Um, and I wanted to share that I really appreciate and like the fact that you all have uh, decided to move towards um, this rolling technical assistance model um, because, uh, you know, on the ground projects tend to have their own timelines. Um, and for us, I think this will be incredibly helpful. Um, our project is really more of a, um, we, we've begun to call it a community impact commercial solar model rather than a kind of more traditional commercial solar model. Um, and the reason for this is our uh, organization is really working to, to find models for community solar that will work in the competitive electricity market in Texas, uh, which presents several unique challenges, um, including the role of the retail electricity provider. 
um, that we've really been trying to to work around and find innovative solutions um, to be able to bring uh, solar to underserved communities in Texas, including renters and low income households. Um, so it, first, in terms of uh, why we requested technical assistance, um, I'll maybe talk about the first round, uh, what we requested and received, and, and then perhaps the second round, um, and then give, give a bit of an, an overview of where we are now. Um, for the first request, uh, we were really looking for due diligence on the economic model that we developed uh, for this community solar model that is behind the meter of a relatively large uh, commercial entity um, that uh, has both renewable energy and social impact targets um, and good relationships within the community to be able to um, invest in, in solar and the benefits of, of uh, solar investment in that community. Um, what I think we received from the, the first round was exactly that. Um, and I'd love to give a, a shout out to uh, Ted Redmond of, of Pale Blue Dot, who we, we heard from earlier, um, and that his assistance for us has been invaluable in uh, really giving us the, um, the confidence to move forward with looking for a pilot and a demonstration for that model. Um, the second round of, of technical assistance that we received, uh, we'd actually put in a request for assistance related to uh, developing a RFP for demonstration of the model that I just described. Um, I was uh, really interested to hear uh, from the, the other participants the, um, that several of the other projects have evolved uh, along the way. And uh, the same happened with our technical assistance. Uh, the, we realized as we were uh, talking with uh, with Ted and with the technical assistance providers, um, that really rather than the RFP, uh, part of what we were striving for was kind of the, the appropriate applications for this commercial solar model. Um, what we found was there are certain uh, commercial entities for which are, are, are simply too small in terms of, of load and ability to host, uh, size of hosting, and then others, other commercial entities which are frankly too large. Um, to, for us to be able to be um, competitive with what uh, can be obtained through a power purchase agreement on the Texas retail electric market. Um, and so uh, we're, we're still kind of undergoing that round of, of uh, assistance now. Um, and it's been very helpful for us to try to find the, the right size, so to speak, for applications of this uh, demonstration or the, the unique model. Um, and so where we are now is, is exactly there. Um, so we, we have a couple of uh, commercial entities who are interested uh, in going through the conceptual diligence phase um, uh, of becoming potential site hosts for these commercial uh, entity, uh, for the commercial conceptual um, community impact commercial solar, excuse me. Um, and, and the technical assistance is really helping us go through the diligence process to design those models and, uh, and implement the program going forward. Um, I know we're sh short on time, so I'll pause there, but happy to uh, take any questions uh, that may be helpful. I, I really appreciate that, Dana. And, um, and sorry to, to rush all of you, but um, one thing that I thought was very interesting is that one, one of the uh, potential sites uh, Dana had told me came through her presenting at, a, at a, an NCSP uh, webinar. They heard about it while they were on the webinar and approached her and now, now they're, they're looking at, uh, at, at that. Um, one other thing I did wanna say is that uh, I saw in the, in, the, uh, in the comments that I should have mentioned that I usually do that this is, this is free technical assistance for, for partners. So know that this is the no cost um, technical assistance. And with that, I'm going to, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Back over to Nicole. I don't think we have time for questions, but Nicole, I will leave that up to you. I think we have one or two minutes for questions. So if folks want to raise their hands, we can we can go ahead and pause for that. And this I can want to highlight this lovely picture from um, this is uh, an old <laughs> staff member of mine at Grid Alternatives Mid Atlantic. So um, very excited to be showcasing some of that. Yeah, and I would like to say thanks to NREL for, for these photos. They, they have a base of them and I, that I was able to choose from. And this is, I just happened to choose one of, one of uh, Nicole's old colleagues. All right. Uh, there were a bunch of questions in the chat that I think did just get addressed. Um, but if folks do have additional questions, obviously feel free to reach out at any time. We'll be following up. Um, with an email with links to the presentation as well as links to how to apply and how to join 
Um, I really want to give a huge shout out and thank you to all of the uh, technical assistance providers, uh, folks who took time to talk about the, the work that they do, um, and, and those who, um, you know, have really leaned in on helping all of our stakeholders as part of the NCSP process, and really a shout out to the recipients. Um, uh, I think it's really helpful to make your stories tangible and, and um, really what does technical assistance actually mean? And obviously also Lynn um, Beander for talking about um, her experience utilizing the online platform. So before we end today, we do have one final poll. Um, so if we want to go to that slide, uh, the last poll is what parts of today's convening were most relevant to your organization or community? And so um, we'll take a second to uh, fill that out and see what the results are. While, while you're doing that, I, I will say this. I put these links here. Uh, again, you will be able to uh, get to them once this is posted, but these are a number of the important links for technical assistance and online platform. Perfect. So Jackie, when you get a chance, we'd love to see those answers. And sorry, did you say that you're going to be sending out that the overview? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. I gotta go. Fantastic, technical assistance overview. <laughs> <laughs> um, glad people found that useful um, and lots of new names today. So very excited to continue to expand um, the, the NCSP community and family. Um, so if again, if you're not um, already a member of NCSP, we do encourage you to join. You then will be able to take advantage of that no cost technical assistance program. Um, one question that was in the chat was, um, we are always looking at expanding those topics. So if you have more needs and ideas, please do let us know. Um, again, here are the links to how to join so, and how to apply to TA. And we really hope to continue these conversations. Do check out our new website at energy.gov slash community solar and stay tuned to uh, our next convening and next steps. So thanks so much everyone and have a good rest of your day. We will talk soon.